good. So um, I am uh, uh, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a physicist, uh, even if I am uh, interested in philosophy questions and I uh, very often talk to philosophers about these uh, uh, questions. Um, my background and my culture is as a physicist, uh, and uh, I will talk to you about space and time um, being a physicist, uh, but addressing, I think, many of the questions which are in uh, foundations of physics and of concerns for philosophers. I understand the audience uh, includes um, a good component of physicists and a good component of philosophers, so I hope I'll be able to talk to both. Um, I will use in most of my talk, more a philosophy style presentation than a physicist style, style presentation. So we'll not use slides for most of the talk, we'll just talk. Um, toward the end, I will present some slides for uh, some points which are more uh, physics uh, and uh, uh, less sort of general uh, conceptual. Um, I'm gonna talk about the direction of time and the notion of agency, but I'm gonna get there slowly. Uh, I want to frame, I, I want to do two things. We, we have 45 minutes, uh, it's time enough to do a, a um, sort of wide uh, uh, discussion about the notion of space and time. So uh, I think this is needed, uh, my own uh, uh, understanding is there's a lot of confusion about the notion of space and time, because uh, there are different uh, problems that get uh, uh, confused, uh, uh, intersected. So I'll try to disentangle the various aspects uh, of uh, the questions. Uh, the general theme being simply, what is space and what is time? Or what do we mean when we say space? Uh, what do we mean when we say time? Uh, in physics and not only uh, in physics. I think that a lot of the questions around, uh, um, a lot of the argument presented uh, uh, mix different levels. And I'll try to disentangle this, uh, uh, these levels. And in fact, the main uh, uh, message of this talk is that when we talk about space and time, we are often talking, uh, we are often referring to different um, uh, concepts uh, that in different contexts uh, uh, mean something different and we get clarity by simply separating these. The reason is, uh, that's a key point, that both, both notions, space and time, and time heavily, more heavily, uh, are layered notions. Namely, we use them for indicating complex concepts that uh, have a lot of uh, uh, properties, attributes, but we also use the same words, space and time, for indicating more, um, uh, more stripped out versions of the same things without those concepts. And then we get confused because uh, uh, we tend to consider uh, all these attributes uh, properties of space and time, and to say space or to say time, bringing everything together without realizing that some of these attributes come at uh, some levels of talking, some level of approximation of nature, some level of talking about special context of nature, which are not wide. And this is the origin of the confusion. I'll try to make sense of all that and disentangle all that. All right, so let me start by space. <clears throat> space is much easier. So I'll talk about space and then I'll, I'll jump to time uh, uh, at, at each step. The first point, and uh, it, it's a key point on which much of the, of the rest uh, 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 re uh, um, relies upon, is that when we say space, uh, um, that the notion of space, uh, it's uh, at least double and strongly double, namely, there is a general notion of space, which is extremely general, and which is the following. If you want, uh, for the philosophers, is the, the, the definition of space that goes back to Aristotle. Space is uh, what we mean when we talk about where. And uh, when we talk about where, we um, uh, always characterize the location, the where of something 
in terms of what is around. Where I am, I am in my house in Verona here. Uh, where is, uh, I don't know, Andorra is between France and Spain. So the location is defined by whatever is around. And uh, therefore, uh, this notion of space refers to um, a relation between objects, this relation between a relation of being, of being contiguous, being next to one another, uh, which is uh, very wide and as such has nothing to do with uh, distance, uh, metric properties of space, Euclidean space, curved space, nothing at all. Uh, this is exactly the definition of uh, uh, space, which is in Aristotle, is a notion of space that we use in everyday life. Uh, where are you? I'm in Paris and I figure you next to the, to the Tour Eiffel and so on and so forth. So this notion of space, it's uh, very present in physics at all levels, including in quantum gravity. I do quantum gravity. In quantum gravity, I talk about spin networks, quantum uh, states of the gravitational fields, uh, different nodes, and this node is next to one another. So the location of this node is uh, uh, connected to the location of another node, and these relations make up uh, sp spatial, spatial uh, relations. All right. Um, a completely different notion of space is the one that was introduced by Newton. Newton introduced a separate notion of space. And if you read the Principia, it's not that Newton says, uh, uh, forget about that notion. Uh, Newton keeps both notions. He calls one the sort of the vulgar one and the, the, the uh, the, 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 the knowledgeable one, whatever, uh, but he, he, he refers to both. And Newton introduces the idea that in order to make sense of the world, uh, it's good to think that there is uh, a fixed uh, space, a sort of entity, uh, I, I'm not gonna discuss to which extent is an entity, but a sort of entity, namely something which is there independently of the things which are uh, located in space. So while the first, the relational notion of space only comes in because there are entities which are uh, next to one another, located with respect to one another. So if, you, if there are no entities, there's no space, right? This is a very clear, all the way from Aristotle to, um, to Descartes. In, in, in Descartes, there's exactly the same relational notion of space. Space is no space if you take away the things. The, the, the property of extension is a property of the things, not of something which remains if you take away the things, the rest extends. In Newton, this, Newton proposes a new way of thinking, so suggests a new concept, which is existence of something which is there independently of the things, right? And this is Newtonian space. And we're very familiar with Newtonian space because we study it at school. Uh, we do exercise about it. And, uh, and, and we know it very well. And this is a sort of container which remains there even if you took away all the things. So in fact, it allows a notion of empty space which was unconceivable in the physics of Descartes or in the physics of Aristotle. The, the notion of empty space becomes conceivable only because there's this new idea that space is something that exists by itself. But it's essential not to get confused to realize that this notion of space uh, is sort of late in, in, in history. It was sort of uh, uh, something in antiquity in, 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 uh, in uh, atomic physics in, in, in Democritus uh, uh, related to that, but it's really only with Newton that becomes uh, uh, dominant and becomes super effective. It works very, very well for describing the world. So the world seemed to be well, well described after Newton by a completely new notion of space. Uh, which is uh, an entity which is there, which is a structure. And this structure is a metric structure. It's a three-dimensional Euclidean space, which is a mathematic describing it, points with distances from one another and so on and so forth, well described by geometry and so on and so forth. All right. So we already have two completely different notions of space. The, the, the notion that things are, 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 are related to one another, a relational notion of space, a Newtonian space is an entity. Now, before going ahead, uh, let me introduce time, because time follows exactly the same uh, uh, pattern. There is a relational notion of time, 
which is ancient, which is instinctive, which is natural, which we use all every day, which is uh, uh, just uh, uh, accounting for the changing of the world, for the, f the events that we see in the world. What is time? It's day, night, day, night, day, night. Uh, uh, the, the hand of my watch that turns, uh, the counting of the events after one another, this is time. And this is, of course, the definition of time that we find in Aristotle. And this is a notion of time that you know, continues through, um, through, uh, through physics. And uh, uh, we also use every time. So when we use the, uh, the question when, we often use it to locate an event with respect to other, to, to other events. When are you coming back? In three days. So the, the sun is going to go down, up, down, up, and then you will come back. Here again, there is no idea of a time existing independently of the event. There is no idea of uh, a metric properties of time or anything like that. It's just the uh, event happenings and uh, uh, the happening of events being related to one another. Namely, we can say when two events are happening next to one another. All right. And once again, next to it, there is a Newtonian idea of time. Newton goes on and on at the beginning of the Principia of saying, yes, yeah, sure, there is this notion of time, but there's another one which is gonna be more useful to do physics, to understand the world, which is the idea, the Newtonian idea that time passes. There is something flowing, existing by itself, described by a variable T, which has metric properties, uh, which it's completely independent of whatever happens in time. Right, this is Newtonian time. So these are two separate notions of time. And I think uh, if we don't disentangle them, we get confused. Why we get confused? Because of course, uh, the history of physics has taught us what is Newtonian um, space and what is Newtonian time uh, better than what we understood uh, uh, from Newtonian physics via special relativity and general relativity and perhaps with, with quantum gravity. So what has happened next, what has happened is, is two steps. The special relativity that this you know, three-dimensional space and one-dimensional time has been understood as a perspective on a four-dimensional Minkowski space-time. But more importantly, and that's a crucial step, with uh, general relativity, this entity, space-time, that Newton and, and special relativity have added to the normal, natural, relational notions of time has been understood as a real entity, um, which, however, is not a non-dynamical, funny entity as it was uh, in the Principia in Newtonian physics, uh, but it is a, 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 a actual physical field, the gravitational field, uh, very much similar in many aspects to the electromagnetic field. So something that satisfies dynamical equations, that interacts, that exchanges energy and momentum, and so on and so forth, a, a, a brother to all the other entities of the world, which is a gravitational field. So here we are. We have, at the light of general relativity, reinterpreted Newtonian space and Newtonian time as a, a, a manifestation on precisely the way of interacting with uh, particles and objects and, and, and stuff uh, of an entity, which is the gravitational field, uh, which is an entity like the others. Of course, we still have the relational notion of space and the relational notion of time. So when we say uh, a black hole is next to a spaceship going toward it, when we say two black holes are going to merge, we are using spatial notion, okay, they get to the same place, uh, which are the old relational notions of our everyday life. The same, same, my two hands come together. There's no uh, metric here, there's no background space time. It's just a, a, a relation between entities uh, being separated, becoming uh, together, and the same with time. Um, the gravitational field itself uh, evolves, changes, it's a, the gravitational field is a process, is a se sequence of events. A black hole forms, separates, does stuff. Uh, and uh, this uh, processuality is a temporal thing. So it's, it's change. 
And any way we use it to, to, to account of this change, for instance, to measure it, it's a temporal notion, right? Um, but the, the metric aspect of it is just the met properties of the gravitational field. So uh, you know, interacting with the gravitational field, the atoms of a pen keeps them at a certain thing, which we call a distance, which remain fixed. This, this defines um, the uh, metric aspect of, uh, of space time. It is not an a priori thing of the universe that can't want to do anything like that. It's just a, a special feature of our world because of the uh, uh, properties of a gravitational field and the way interact with, uh, with matter. Now, if we go one step further and we go toward quantum gravity, uh, we don't have a, a, a theory we, uh, we agree upon, but we have tentative theories, of course. Uh, we have more than ones that work well. And in particular, we have, for instance, with quantum gravity, we have theories where uh, the gravitational field is the, the, the classical gravitational field, Einstein space time, is just the semi classical, the classical limit of a quantum entity. So we have a quantum entity, something you can interact with and uh, uh, you can measure, has properties, which in the classical limit is described as a space time continuum. There's nothing uh, strange in that, we're very used to that because uh, uh, the electromagnetic waves are a continuous four dimensional thing to Bay Maxwell equations. And we know that there are good description of the world, but an approximate description of the world, which is really going on. There are photons, there are discrete photons that, uh, that, uh, that interact. The interaction of the discrete photons at a scale large with respect to the sort of the size of the photon, with respect to each bar. Uh, appears as a four-dimensional continuum. So the four-dimensional space-time continuous emerges from a quantum gravitational field, which is a quantum stuff, a real stuff of the world interacting with uh, Dirac field, with uh, young Mills fields, and making up the world, right? Which in the semi-classic, in the classical limit, shows up exactly like the electromagnetic field shows up like uh, electromagnetic waves, the ones of the antennas of our television, the, the quantum gravitational field in the, in the uh, classical limit shows up as a four-dimensional space-time continuous. Of course, if we look at the world uh, not in this approximation, but if you want to describe a black hole that, uh, that uh, collab uh, evaporates or the Big Bang, uh, we cannot use the space-time continuous. There is no space-time in the Einsteinian sense, and therefore there is no space time in the special relativistic sense, therefore there is no space time in the Newtonian sense, right? So there's no space time. Space time emerges from that, but this doesn't mean that the fundamental notion of space as localizing things and time as counting events evaporates. They're still there. They're still there. They make perfectly sense. We can talk an event and then another event, and we can also Use, choose a variable to count them and call this variable time if we want. At this point, it's an issue of names. Uh, but the space-time continuous is not there in quantum uh, gravity. And I think there is a large, uh, not universal, but large consensus that quantum gravity is nothing like space-time continuum. All right? So this is a general uh, picture of how um, space and time are used in our description of the world. We get confused if we say space-time as a unique thing, and then we get confused, uh, oh, but if in quantum gravity there is no space-time, what do we mean by localization? No, I mean, the, the relational notion of space and relational notion of time, the old ones, the one of Aristotle and Descartes, are always in our way of, of, of describing the world. Now, for what uh, concerns the properties of space and time, if, if you think of this story, you realize that the common attribute that we, um, uh, we assume uh, space and time have, let, let me take, talk about time for, for a moment, it's easier. Uh, in our usual experience, time is universal. It's the same for, for everybody. I mean, given two events the, at one hour distance, there's always one hour distance. Well, we know this is not true outside the special relativistic approximation, right? We know if things move fast, this is not true anymore. Between two events, uh, you can have one hour or five hours, depending how you move. Um, the notion of a global time, the same time that works everywhere in the universe in some coherent way, doesn't work 
in general relativity. There's no notion of a global time. You can use any coordinate you want. There's nothing, no preferred one. So uniqueness, globality, and so on, they are lost when you go to more general um, uh, domains of nature. The uniqueness of time, the globality of time, only makes sense in, the, in, in, in a restricted domain where you can disregard quantum gravity, quantum effect, there is low curvature and things move at low velocity with one respect to, to the other one, which means that they're well-defined notions, but within, within a domain. This is the, uh, this is very much in common space and time, but for what concerns time specifically, our common notion of time has other properties, which are, we have to look at their origin, not going down toward more general things, but the other way around, going toward more restricted things. And this I'm coming to uh, the uh, topic of the orientation of time, which is what I wanted to uh, get at. Um, the time of our experience, it's oriented. The future is completely different from the past, okay? Where does it come from? We know that at the level of microphysics, uh, uh, forget quantum mechanics for, for a moment, the takeaway quantum mechanics, if you want, we can talk about quantum mechanics later, but let's say in classical mechanics, which is easier. So we are in approximation in which uh, we disregard quantum effect. Uh, the fundamental equation of the world do not distinguish past from future. Uh, Maxwell equation, Newton equation, Einstein equations, even quantum field theory equations do not distinguish past from future. Where does distinction come from? Well, we know because we have an account of uh, uh, thermodynamics where, where there is a distinction between past and future, statistical mechanics, uh, and uh, we have clear the fact uh, that the time orientation appears at the macroscopic level uh, because uh, we use macroscopic description uh, of the world, so we use macroscopic uh, variables, coarse-grained variables, which define an entropy such that it is a contingent fact of the world with respect to the fundamental law, that in one direction of time, the one that we call the past, uh, this entropy was lower. So we live in an entropy gradient, okay? So we live in a, in, in a particular solution of, of the, 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 the uh, equation of motion, which has a property that under this macroscopic uh, coarse graining, in the past, uh, the, macro, the, the macroscopic state uh, corresponds to a small number of uh, microscopic uh, state. This is what creates this uh, very strong uh, 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 asymmetry between the past and the future. Why? Because there are processes, microscopic processes, that uh, we see happening uh, repeatedly and never see the opposite one. This, of course, is not true in the microphysics. In the microphysics, every process that happens in one uh, uh, direction can happen, can happen in the opposite direction, and every process is equally unlikely. It's only in the macrophysics that we have a notion of some process being more likely and less likely, because uh, um, when we take a, a, a single uh, state, macro state, there are many uh, micro state uh, inside, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, some, uh, uh, most of the micro state evolve in one way, a few evolve in another way. So we have a notion of uh, more likely Hood or less likelihood. So the, um, the time orientation of the universe, of the world, of the cosmos in which we live, uh, is not to be looked down into fundamental physics, is to look up into uh, macrophysics uh, and in the uh, contingent fact that uh, the, uh, uh, the course graining we use, uh, which is not arbitrary, is determined by the way we interact with the world. So it's a, it's a perspectival but absolutely real fact of the world has the property of past noetic. All right. Now, this is disturbing because uh, there are aspects uh, which seem so strongly time oriented in the world that is hard to believe uh, that uh, it's something which is not fundamental, right? And there are two aspects of the world, uh, 
uh, one is the closest closure of the past. We know the past, the past is fixed. Okay, we cannot change the past. The future is open, we can change it. So why, how is it possible? If the story I've given you is a right story, why is the past fixed and the future open? And that's what I want to address. And surprisingly, I've been going around this question for years and uh, uh, I never could put my hands on it. And then in the last couple of years, thanks to a number of things, uh, I think I've got some clarity and this is what I want to share um, uh, with you. And surprisingly, uh, it's the same story. The, what, what, the fixings of the past and the open of the future is very much related and is of course related uh, to two notions. One is the existence of traces of the future. We remember the future, we don't remember the past. And the other is the notion of agency. We can decide about the future and we cannot decide about the past. So that's what I want to understand as a physicist. And I think it, it seemed very hard for me to understand that. I think uh, the, the, the solution of that from the point of view of the physicist uh, is not difficult. In fact, it's easy. Let me discuss the two um, points separately, the past and then the future. The past, um, we know the past, the past is fixed. Why the past is fixed? Because we know it. Why we know it? Because we have traces of it, right? I have pictures of myself as a young kid. I have, uh, we have the, the, there are uh, fossils in the, there are steps in the sand that indicate me that somebody walked in the past on the sand, not in the future. There are craters in the moon that refers to the fact that a stone fell down. There's nothing of the sort related to the future. So given the present, we can use the equation of motion to predict the future and retrodict the past, of course, I mean, in a, uh, if there's not, not too much noise, uh, for instance, for the solar system, we can predict eclipses and we can calculate past eclipses equally. But in addition, about the past, we have traces. We have a lot of records. Why? Why the world is so full of records? Um, it turns out that the answer is simple. And in fact, uh, it is a completely thermodynamical answer. If you are in uh, an equilibrium situation, Thermodynamics tell you that the past and the future uh, are uh, uh, indistinguishable. But the world is not in a thermodynamical, in an equilibrium situation because there is past line today. In addition, there are two features which characterize the real universe. One is that uh, it is strongly separated in uh, um, slowly, weakly interacting components. And the thermalization time, the exchange of heat energy between these components, the thermalization time is very, very long, right? Um, a star burning is thermalizing, but it took millions of years, billions of years, okay? Uh, the universe as a whole is trying to thermalize, but it's not getting any close to thermal equilibrium because the thermalization time physically are very, very long. Now it turns out that it is sufficient to have a thermodynamical system divided uh, in subsystems with long thermalization times, and boom, immediately you get traces of the future. Oh, sorry, traces of the past. Where is the breaking between future and past symmetry coming from? Well, of course, from the fact that I'm assuming that there is low entropy. So if you have uh, um, systems, uh, a, a system broken in subsystems, uh, each one of them is in equilibrium, but they are not in equilibrium between themselves. They are different temperatures, um, which is the case of, of the universe, right? The, the, the helium of the universe and the hydrogen of the universe are not in thermal equilibrium because you can um, uh, start a, a, a star and, and, and the entropy goes up. Uh, hydrogen burns into helium. So slowly, you get a thermalization between hydrogen and helium, but the two systems are uh, not in equilibrium and uh, the, the thermalization time is very, very long. So this universe is in that situation. Let me give you an intuition about the, um, the way this happened through a super simple model. Um, let me share my screen. Um, do you see the... Can you make me a sign? Uh, do you see the screen? Yeah. 
Antonio can use yes, Nathan. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, so this is a super simple model just to, to, to see what is going on in a, in, a, in, a, in a very intuitive way. This is a box uh, with uh, one system which is formed uh, by these uh, little uh, orange particles moving very fast. Uh, and uh, I assume that uh, I'm giving a, a, um, a, a, a sort of thermal description of that. I don't know the position of each one of them, but I know the average energy, okay? So I know the temperature of them. And then there are these blue penduli, a certain number of them, which can, can oscillate, which uh, to start with, on the average, have a much less energy um, uh, than uh, average energy per, per degree of freedom than uh, uh, the red particles. And uh, let's assume that the, the box is large and the interactions are rare. And uh, in addition, the, 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 the penduli themselves can interact among themselves, but again, they can exchange energy only with uh, weekly, so the thermalization time among themselves is uh, uh, slow, long. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that once in a while, one of the red particles is going to hit a blue pendulum, and because of past of, of, of the initial unbalance, uh, there's much more energy on average on, on the particles of the penduli. So on average, the energy is going to go from the particle to the penduli. This is the core of, of the statistical hypothesis, right? So one of the pendulums is going to oscillate, and slowly it will, um, uh, uh, by friction, brings uh, exchange energy with the other penduli and, and, and go down. So if you take a picture of the system at some moment, say now, this picture here, you're going to see one pendulum or a few penduli which oscillate. This pendulum here is oscillating, and this tells you that in the past, there was a heat between a particle and a pendulum. So the oscillation of the pendulum is a trace of an event, an event here being a passage of energy from the hot to the cold system. It's a trace of an event in the past. And if you think for a while, all traces are like that. I mean, pictures, uh, uh, photographs, uh, craters in the moon, uh, steps in the sand. Uh, I'm not going to uh, discuss each of them one by one, but traces are all of this sort. There is an imbalance that creates uh, between two systems that creates a local imbalance, which stays there for a while. And for that, you need long thermalization times. But the key point is that uh, it is sufficient to have system separation and long thermalization times uh, to produce large amount of traces. And I'm gonna, I don't wanna go much into that, but this uh, allows us to do a lot of stuff. Namely, um, it is possible, you see, memories have information, right? I know which one of the pendulum is oscillating. I know that something happened. There's a correlation, which is an event in the past. Where does this information come from? It comes from the raises in entropy when the, the, the heat went from the hot to the cold system. It, therefore, the information cannot be more than the increase of this entropy. But I can compute the increase of the entropy just in terms of the temperatures and uh, just, just in terms of thermodynamical parameters, the temperatures, the uh, thermalization times, and the heat capacity. So I can compute the information, the maximal information that can be stored into memory coming from low entropy, from the raising entropy, which means that information stored in, in, in memories, uh, it's sourced by the negative information in the, in, in the past low entropy, which is, I think is, is a remarkable result. Where does the information come from? It's sort of microscopic information that when there is imbalance can come out to be macroscopic. This is going to become even more clear uh, in, in a moment, because uh, uh, let me go. Let me go to agency. Let me talk about the future. We, what is agency? We are uh, macroscopic things, which we can decide the future. We, what does it mean? We can have the same few past which evolve in different futures. I can, uh, same past, I can take this pen, I can decide whether the future is the pen stays here or the pens fall down. I decide. So the physics of me determines two different 
future macroscopic state. So the macroscopic description of the world can branch, right? Uh, in the slide here, I am describing the macro history that can branch. And in the moment, in the period in which branch, this is an agent that can make it branch. This is not, of course, in contradiction with microscopic determinism. No? And all this could be said in terms of quantum terms, but it's going to be much more complicated. So it's much easier to talk classical. So it's not in contradiction with classical determinism because a single macroscopic history, it's a large number of micro histories, some of which can evolve in one way, some of which can evolve in the other way. The macroscopic description of the world is ignoring some degrees of freedom. So ignoring uh, a part of the story. Now agency comes exactly from this ignoring part of the story, right? This is basic Spinoza. Uh, free will is me not knowing why I do something, right? But there's some story which I do something of which I'm not aware and this is what I call free will. So the same ma macro history can branch in different because different micro histories have a different story and the mechanism, what, whatever happens uh, in the moment of branching, the, there's some microscopic physics that determines it, but macroscopically, it's just a system. It, uh, in the macroscopic description, I'm ignoring that part of the microphysics, so I see a system that decides, that branches. So decision is true, free will is true, is real, but it's just the real in the sense that it, 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 it's, a, it, it's physics, it's just some underlying microphysics determining what's gonna happen, okay? And if you go back to the previous picture, you realize that uh, the same picture uh, represent essentially the same phenomenon. Because you see, here is the same uh, macro history, uh, macro history says is the position of the penduli, which at some point branches in different futures. So the same physics here describe also agency. That's the beauty of this, uh, of this story. And once again, I can use the uh, thermodynamics to um, compute the information produced in uh, agency in terms of purely um, thermodynamic parameters. Namely, if I choose, I choose between alternatives, I produce um, information, right? If I choose between two alternatives, I produce one bit of information. Before I, macroscopically, I didn't know which one is gonna happen. After I know which one is gonna happen. So I produce one bit of information. Where does information come from? I cannot produce information from nothing. Well, it comes from, because I, for doing that, entropy goes up. I, I just showed it. And I compute the amount of entropy that goes up in terms of macroscopic parameter. So here I show that uh, information produced, uh, stored in trace and produced in agency are sourced by, uh, by agency from, from what? From the negative uh, entropy of the of the of the past, and I think this is a this is a beautiful and uh, idea which deserves to be much more studied because uh, uh, information is based on biology, sociology, uh, culture, everything. Where does this, all this information come from? It all comes from memories, traces, and and from agents that decide something. You know, a, a writer that writes a book. Where does it come from? From a point of view of physicist, it's just past low entropy. It's just the, 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 the information past low entropy, which comes up into the microscopic world by, by consuming free energy. So by consuming, so it all comes from the sun that burns and the low entropy uh, photons that come to the sun, the, the free energy of the photons that come to the sun. And these are formulas that give you, I'm not going to them, that give you um, the number of alternatives that you can choose from given the, the thermal history situation. Now, I've used the, uh, a lot of my time, so um, I just want to sort of uh, uh, bring back, uh, bring everything in a, in a uh, this is my final slide, and uh, I'm just gonna comment this slide and try to bring this story together. Uh, and then I'm sure there are all sorts of uh, questions, open questions. Um, the, the slide here uh, bring together the different, the different pieces. So the, the, the main point here is not to confuse uh, our uh, relational notion of where, uh, uh, our relational notion of space 
uh, where, um, with uh, the, the Newtonian notions of uh, uh, space as a Euclidean diametric space, uh, nor to confuse uh, our sort of intuitive relational notion of time, which is both of them are still perfectly good ways to for us to describe the world. So the world can be described in terms of location and in terms of events related to one another, right? We always have done so, we are still doing so, we're doing so, Aristotle was doing so, Newton was doing so, Einstein was doing so, in quantum gravity we're doing so. Okay, so this remains, and this anchor, what we really mean by space and time in the most general sense. Uh, the universe is events. It's not that in quantum gravity there is uh, no time. Of course there's time in this sense. Quantum gravity is about happening, not about anything static. But then in particular, uh, above them, Newton introduced a notion of this Euclidean uh, 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 container box in which we're immersed that uh, we just understood this low speed uh, limit of uh, Minkowski space time, which in terms this low curvature limit uh, of uh, um, a, a pseudo Riemannian uh, uh, general relativistic manifold, the space-time of general relativity, which in turn is just a classical limit of the physics of a quantum uh, gravitational field, okay? Same is true for time, so for, for Newtonian time, the, 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 the universal uh, global uh, Newtonian time is just an approximation which holds uh, when uh, there, there are uh, low relative speeds in a low curvature region uh, and when we disregard uh, the quantum effect uh, of, uh, of gravity. Um, in addition, time has a strongly um, uh, oriented characteristic. So our local time here, the future is completely different for the past and we have a very clear um, uh, uh, sense of the um, uh, the, the, the closure of the past, the fact that the past is fixed and the future is uh, uh, it's open. And uh, uh, why? Because uh, uh, it's a contingent fact that we live in a region uh, of, uh, we, we interact the, with the world, uh, not with all the degrees of freedom of the world, but only with a few degrees of freedom. So obviously we use a macroscopic description of, uh, of, of nature. And with respect to this description is the contingent fact that entropy was low in the past. And uh, I've given you the specific mechanism that when entropy is low in the past and as is true in our, concretely, in our own universe, uh, the, the, the cosmos is divided in subsystem very weakly interacting automatically, the unbalance in the past produces traces of the past and allows uh, uh, systems to branch the microscopic history, namely allows uh, system to be agent. Of course, this is not this is not a full account of the physics of, of an animal that decides. Well, I mean, it's, 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 we have to understand how animals completely work. But the point is that nothing in physics present prevent that. Uh, physics is perfect, perfectly compatible with the existence of physical system mechanism that do exactly what animals do or what we do. Okay. Now, why this is crucial? Because sometimes we tend to instinctively to take some aspects of time which are high level, like the closure of the past or the universality of time or the uniqueness of time, and imagine that we cannot think of reality without these. And these were making a big mistake because these only are uh, features that depend on the uh, specific approximation in this particular region of space-time in which we, we happen to live. And finally, and that's my last comment, we should also remember, uh, this is the, the last point, but it sort of uh, justifies and, and motivates and bring all that together. We, uh, humans, or we animals, we have a brain that uses heavily the traces of the past um, and uh, uses heavily the openness of the future. Namely, our brain is constantly computing the future and constantly acting 
in a way, because of evolution, because of biology, because of the mechanism of what we are, to sort of maximize our um, survival possibility in, in, in the future. So we come out from this mechanism. We are the effect of, uh, we are those mechanisms that, that, do, that do so, right? So our brain is constantly remembering the past. So the existence of traces is not just a, an accessory fact of the universe, which sort of happened to notice. Uh, it grounds the way we, 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 we are. It grounds what our brain does and the openness of the future as well. I think that um, Husserl is the one who most clearly uh, pointed this out. Husserl, I mean, from the point of view of a physicist, uh, it's, a, it, it, it's a psychologist, or <laughs> he wouldn't like that, but he's, a, he's, a, he's the, 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 the opening up of how a, a, an animal works, how we work, is in, in particular, a specific uh, physical system. And for us, time is not the time of a clock. For a, clo a clock doesn't know about time, because a clock doesn't know the future, doesn't know the past. A clock has no memory, okay? There's no time for a clock. If by time we mean what time, the time of our experience. The time of our experience is remembering the past, anticipating the future, thanks to the fact that physically, the world around us, uh, there is a gradient of entropy, so there are traces of the, of the past, and there is a possibility of, of, of agencies. So our experience of time is the memory and the anticipation, okay? And so we have this sense of flowing, right? This is, uh, this is, uh, this up to now it has happened and the future will, it, it's gonna happen, which is very real, but it's just our own particular uh, uh, connection with events in, in, in the world. It has nothing to do with the uh, temporality of the universe by itself as we understand it, when we, um, don't think about our own specific experience, don't think about macrophysics, don't think about uh, the low speed limit, don't think about the, the, uh, the, the, the low curvature limit and, and so on and so forth. So um, this is a overall picture. I think it makes sense. It's not that everything is clear because there are many little holes there which needs to be uh, worked out. I think it, it, it's a beautiful picture. It, it, it allows us to understand our experience where times come from, which is the part that depend on nature, which is the part depend on us, which is the part that depend on some orientation. Um, once again, the main, and I'm closing here, the main message here is uh, careful. When you say time or when you say space, you might indicate very different things in this picture. Thank you. So the first person I see on the list with a hand raised is Chris Butrick. So please, Chris, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so I really like uh, the, the sort of the picture you draw, the overall view I think is very attractive and uh, has many, um, uh, interesting aspects now if we want to accept that the macroscopic physics uh, whatever exactly it is and whatever you know exactly happens there is still grounded somewhat is still really uh, sort of emerging from the microphysical uh, uh, events and structures etc cetera, etc cetera, then it seems to me it I, then I really don't see how it could possibly emerge, uh, so sort of an asymmetry could emerge without something asymmetric also happening at the fundamental level. So it seems to me that in some sense there must be some sort of low entropy state included in the microphysics at, of the very early universe or something like that for, the, for this entropic story to to, to even take off. Now, I'm asking you, is this the wrong idea? So is there really nothing in the microscopic physics that would somehow give rise to that or, or correspond to a low entropy uh, physics? And if that's wrong, why is this wrong? Uh, and if it's the right view, then how should we think of, of, of entropy in the microphysical uh, situation, maybe in the context of loop quantum gravity or some other quantum gravitational theory. Uh, uh, I mean, how, how would that be encoded in the, in the microphysics? A 
thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, I, I think I understand the question, and uh, um, um, it's a deep question. Uh, I think that uh, um, the answer is double. Let, let me try to separate the, uh, the points. Um, I see no reason whatsoever for which, no indication whatsoever for which uh, the microphysics should have uh, um, some, um, uh, something that breaks uh, time reversal invariance. So, uh, and, and this, I think, to, to understand this, uh, we can forget quantum mechanics, we can forget quantum, uh, we can forget general relativity, we can forget special relativity, we can just go back to imagining that the world uh, was uh, a Newtonian, a bunch of particles bouncing around in a Euclidean space, because the, the question doesn't change. I mean, it's not that uh, a Newtonian world uh, already has the same, um, the same issue, the same property, the same, the same uh, microscopic time reversal invariance and macroscopic uh, uh, non-reversal invariance. So if we understand it there, I, I think there's no reason to think that things are gonna change when we bring in quantum mechanics, quantum gravity, whatever, big bang, cosmology. So what happened in the, in the Newtonian case where we have a very simple understanding of a um, situation like that. I mean, if we have a billiard balls bouncing around uh, following Newton laws, and actually, if you have a model, we can bring it in a computer and uh, bouncing balls around. And we can put in a perfectly uh, time symmetric um, uh, uh, laws and see what happened. We easily realize that uh, each single micro history uh, can also be reversed. There is a corresponding micro history going backward. Okay. And uh, each single Micro, micro historian going forward is very unlikely. It's a probability one over the possible, all possible histories. And each possible backward going micro history is equally unlikely because it's one over all possible then, okay? Now, so, uh, but, but we also see that if we take all the billiard board uh, with, with a lot of energy in a corner and we let them go, they move out. So, uh, what's going to happen? What is happening here? What is happening is that uh, 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 with respect to that particular history, all the, all the balls in one corner spreading out, okay, um, there is, of course, the, the time reversal history. But uh, if we use a macroscopic description of that particular history, that particular one, and when and we only count the number of balls, say in the last on the right of the uh, of the board, uh, we see that they are in a uh, unlikely situation. They go to a likely situation. Okay, so what's going on here? It's what's going on is that uh, there is a particular cross grain. There is a particular perspective description of of, of that, uh, and it's a description that breaks the, the time symmetry in in, in in so on. Now. What does it mean? Uh, the, the single history doesn't have the symmetry of the theory, of course. So the, the single history has peculiar properties. Um, and that particular history, all the balls in one, in, in one corner spread, spreading out, uh, has a property that it allows a, a, a macroscopic description of, of, of that sort uh, that other histories don't, uh, don't have. There's nothing mysterious here. There's nothing strange. There is nothing. So if it happens that the actual history of the universe is of that kind, and if it happens that we, as physical system, couple with the rest of the universe in such a way that these macroscopic variables are the ones we couple from, um, then it's not mysterious that uh, there is a, 
uh, a breaking of symmetry in a particular solution of a theory, which is time symmetric. So I think there's no mystery here. However, uh, so this will be a, a completely no, 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 no answer to your question. However, am I satis fully satisfied by this no, no answer? No, I'm not. And I share your, wait a minute, isn't there something more to understand here? Why does it, so we could just stop here and say, well, the universe happened to be like that. But we could also happen, uh, is, is there a reason for which uh, this is so? I mean, in a sense, low past entropy is a specialness condition. So what is this specialness condition ground on? What does it guarantee? And this is, I think, is your intuition say, well, there should be something in, uh, in, uh, in maybe in the microphysics, I don't know, the big bang physics, whatever, that actually breaks the time reversal invariance. I think the question is open. This is the question of uh, why past low entropy, which we don't have an answer. Why past low entropy is a, is a fact. We take it, uh, David Albert say, well, take it as the law of nature, which is fine. We can take a law of nature, but we are scientists. We can say, well, we can make sense of it better. I have written some paper in which I suggest um, that uh, it's fully perspectival, namely, given any micro history, you can also always find systems, subsystems that couple with particular macro variables with respect to which one end is low entropy. This I've called uh, the perspectival, perspectival interpretation of, of, of entropy. If this is correct, I don't want to go into that because I'm not sure I believe it. But if we, if we go in that direction, maybe what is special is not the universe, the original state, it's just that we belong to a part of physics with respect to which uh, time is oriented. Like, I mean, why the, tur the, the sky rotates around us? Uh, well, it doesn't. We belong to a rotating thing with respect to which the, 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 time, the time rotates. So there might be a story like that or another story that can be added. And this is the question, why past entropy? But there's a, that's a second part of the answer, if you want. If you, if you just are happy with a contingent fact that uh, uh, with respect to the actual cost graining we use in the past was, uh, the entropy was low in the past, uh, I don't think there's anything mysterious anymore. Can it's I, can I briefly? Uh, yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So I was really, my, my question was more about the first part. So I would be, you know, maybe happy about accepting contingent facts like that. Uh, but even there, it seems to me, even if there's a, a complete time reversal uh, um, invariant, uh, you know, at the level of the laws and, you know, the, the physics is like that. Nevertheless, in order to, to, to have this uh, emerging uh, time orientation, we have to happen to be in a universe which starts out in a low entropy state. Otherwise, this is not going to work. So uh, there must be some state earlier uh, in the early universe somehow that was in a lower entropy state. And I'm, what, my question is, th th does this mean, does it correspond to something interesting or something we could say about what that would mean at the level of the microphysics what is it at the level of microphysics that's a a, a low entropy state something is uh, or is it really just at the at the macroscopic level that this can uh, make sense i, I don't know whether yeah, I, this, I, <laughs> yeah I, see the question. I, <laughs> okay. I see the question i i see the question i i the answer is I don't know, because uh, once again, uh, I, I don't see anything micro in low entropy. Uh, entropy is truly, this entropy, of course, there are other entropies, but this entropy, it, it's truly something that only appears in a microscopic description. I, I've written some papers sort of tracing out concretely in cosmology where the low entropy is. And the low entropy is uh, essentially in the smallness of the scale factor uh, in the in the past, uh, so if you want, if, if you describe the universe in terms of you know matter moving in an expanding universe with the uh, with the scale factor, uh, it's not in equilibrium because the scale factor is very small. It's like having all the energy on a single variable, 
uh, um, listen, I don't know how to answer to your question more. I think this is a this is a this is truly why past law entropy is truly the open question in in this story. Can we account better for why past law entropy? But this is a question. And not, uh, well, is there some breaking of, uh, of time reversal invariance in lows right now? That, that's, that means, that's wrong. If you ask, well, what can we account for past low entropy? This is a good question. Okay, thank you. Next in line, we have uh, Yazan. Go ahead, Yazan. Uh, thank you, Professor Ravelli, for the talk. Um, so my question is, um, based on your work and other physicists that they've done work on quantum gravity, some philosophers have been trying to come up with metaphysical accounts of emergence to explain how does space-time emerge at the macro level from the, uh, from the level of quantum gravity. Do you think these attempts are worthy from a physicist's point of view? Do you think they might tell us something or do you think they're just, you know, uh, mental gymnastics. Do you think that somehow physics might be able to explain uh, why does space-time exist at the macro world without the need for emergence or metaphysical emergence? Do you think that maybe if we consider the world, the macro world, to be more fundamental than the micro world, then this would eliminate the need for emergence? So maybe it's only like a matter of rearranging our fundamental um, Concept. So maybe if you consider the world, the macro world, to be fundamental, then uh, the, 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 then the absence of space-time and in quantum gravity equations shouldn't uh, be a problem because it's not the fundamental that grounds the entire universe. So I'm, I'm just wondering what you think about this. Wait, what do you mean by the macro world being fundamental? So, so it's so like the um, yeah. So so. So usually it's assumed that um, the fundamental level is the, is the quantum level. So the quantum level is fundamental and everything emerges from there. But what if we think the opposite? We think that the micro world is the fundamental and when we look at the, when we look at the quantum level, we're just um, looking at uh, one small bit of the big picture. So we don't need to, to worry about emergence per se. Um. I'm not sure I understand exactly the the uh, what you're asking. Let me let me say a few things, and then you, you tell me if I'm out of uh, out of the point. Um, first of all, there there have been a lot of talking, and I'm aware of various different opinions about emergence of space time, also yeah. in the philosophical literature, and people claiming different things about that. Yeah. Um, including that uh, it's inconsistent to have space-time emergence and things like that. Um, I, I think it's, uh, I, first of all, I think the philosophical reflection on these uh, issues is, is good and it's needed, it's important. Huh? Um, in fact, I myself encourage it, I'm interested in, in reading what philosophers say of it, but it, but it should listen to physics. And it should uh, it should not just go go out by itself without listening to what we actually have learned about the world. And I often find uh, a confusion in the philosophical literature, and uh, and uh, and my uh, presentation was was meant to address it uh, largely. And the confusion is that um, uh, space time, in the sense of Newtonian space time. From the point of view of physics, uh, it's certainly not fundamental. It's just a, an approximation of something else. It cannot be fundamental if it's an approximation of something else. So the idea I'm thinking of um, team modeling, that we cannot think, we cannot even make measurement the thing unless we have space and time. So the space and time as a continuum should be there. It's just nonsense. I mean, we cannot think about the world uh, uh, 
unless there's a Newtonian space time. Like, come on. I mean, what about all the humans in, in, in around the Mediterranean before Newton who thought very well about space, well, the world without a Newtonian space and time, just in terms of relational space and relational time? What about Descartes? He was an idiot. I mean, he didn't believe in, 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 in a background space existing there by itself, right? So it's perfectly coherent to have a weaker notion of space and a weaker notion of time and to see the Newtonian space uh, or the generativistic space uh, just as a uh, approximate notion uh, appropriate to describe the world in some regime but not in not in general now that's one point uh, what one means by fundamental I, I I don't like the word fundamental because fundamental is a funny word I mean it's a uh, uh, I know that sometimes we understand something and out of this something we can derive something else. Okay, so in that sense, uh, one thing is more fundamental than the other because we understand something in terms of something else. So that, in that sense, we, I think I can talk about fundamental. In, in that sense, I can understand macrophysics in terms of microphysics, but not the way around, not the other way around. How can I understand the other way around? I cannot understand class quantum mechanics in terms of quantum mechanics. It just doesn't make any sense. Quantum mm -hmm. mechanics is an approximation to class mechanics, in, in my opinion. Every attempt to do the opposite uh, is just, uh, you know, thinking that the, the chart is pushing the, 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 the horses, is the horses is pulling the chart, not the other way around. Um, one should not confuse, uh, how would I say, um, ontology from noseology from, from the theory of knowledge. Um, of course, we have macroscopic apparata that make measurement, and so uh, we use macrophysics to, to make experiment about microphysics. But if we have a coherent world picture, the macrophysics should be accounted for in terms of some general story, which include everything and therefore should include the, macrophys the microphysics. Is that an answer to what you are yeah, asking? Yeah, thank or? you. That, yeah, that, that explains it very well. Thank you. Okay, many thanks. Now we have uh, Thomas Pigen. So Thomas, please go ahead. Hey, Thomas. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you very much. This was a great talk. Um, my question is going to be uh, a question from a philosopher. So uh, the way I understand your project is that you try, uh, you're trying to account to explain for some well-known features and phenomena related to time by reference to, uh, ne, to entropy, to the uh, uh, past law hypothesis, uh, so on and so forth. And while I can clearly see how you can do this with respect to things such as asymmetry of time, and perhaps also things like why the past is fixed and the future is open, I still don't see how you can do the same with respect to things like the passage of time. The, the passing of time, things like uh, like how how can you account, for instance, in terms of entropy, lower entropy in the past? How can you account for such things as some people, for instance, some philosophers believe that there is only one present, objective present, and the past is already gone. The future is not yet uh, fully existent. Uh, so how can you, how can you account for that sort of uh, for that sort of uh, intuitions, I mean, regarding the passage of time, objective passage of time and the objective existence and reality of present uh, uh, as opposed to the past and the future. It's a, it's a great question. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to, 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 to address it, but let me start by, um, by turning a question to you. Um, of course, you're gonna understand in which sense I ask a question. Can you say what you mean by passage of time? Well, uh, well, of course, this, this is a difficult question. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I definitely have the experience of passage of the passage, but of course, to put it Good. in words, it's, it, it's, it's a huge challenge. But my understanding was that you were trying to do that because several uh, uh, times in your talk, you mentioned the notion of the passage of time. So I was thinking that perhaps your idea is to somehow give it more. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, yeah, <laughs> like putting the question yeah, yeah. back oh. to you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Car uh, Carlo, your uh, uh, phone is muted. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My, my third question to you was, was, was a rhetorical. Um, uh, you gave exactly the answer that I, 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 I expected. I, thought, I, I was hoping you to give. Um, I, I know there is a, a huge discussion in philosophy, much before relativity, in fact. Uh, MacTaggart, uh, uh, A series, B series, uh, uh, and then, you know, the meat of the passage of time, a famous uh, paper, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I have a, let me tell you what I think. Um, uh, of course, time passes, right? I mean, we have uh, half an hour to go and time is passing. The question is, what does it mean? And uh, to what extent um, the thing we call passage of time, we have to interpret it as something grounded in, in, in the grammar of the world independent from us and to what extent has to do with our own uh, uh, experience of time, the time of our experience. Um, it's a delicate balance. And I think a lot of my work is trying to disentangle the pieces because of course there are many aspects um, of time which have nothing to do with us. Uh, the future is different from the past in nature, in, macro in macroscopic nature. It's a fact, it's there, it's out there. There are traces of the past in macroscopic nature. Um, but there's a large amount of our experience of time, which is not grounded. Uh, it, we're not going to understand it in the metaphysics, in, 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 in trying to deepen our metaphysics of time, natural time. Unless we're idealist or we're Heideggerian and we want to understand the world in terms of our own experience, right? But that's, or, or, or we are phenomenologists and just we want to put uh, experience first. But a physicist doesn't want to put experience first, want to derive experience from uh, a fact of, fact of the world and realize that some aspect of our experience are just directly grounded in the world, right? They're just, we just immediately, others are much more mediated. And, and the point is that disentangle, disentangle that. So I think, now I, now I come to your, to your question. I think that a lot of what we call uh, passage of time is just uh, the, the physical fact that uh, uh, the, the the past is, fi is fixed in the sense that the present uh, has uh, allows a lot of traces in the past, and these are in our brain, and uh, allows different microscopic futures. Uh, and this openness of the, fu uh, of the, uh, of the future is a, is, is a major ingredient of our feeling of the passage of time. Uh, beyond that, Trying to say exactly what we mean, it, it seems to me shows that uh, we are talking about a vague intuition, and therefore we should address that. It is a psychologist that should address that, not a physicist, with full respect to the psychologists, which are doing their job, right? I mean, it's just that um, I love a person. This is completely real. It's a real fact that I love a person, but I shouldn't look into physics. I shouldn't think that there is a uh, you know, uh, the little god which throws arrows and this is a fact of nature. So it's, it's, it's things happening inside me in the relation between me and a person. So I think the passage, the so-called passage of time, the sense of feeling that's so hard to pinpoint uh, uh, belongs to the, those intuitions uh, which uh, confuse us uh, because uh, uh, regard our, our own functioning more than nature itself. I do think that we understand nature in terms of events, in terms of facts, in, in terms of happenings, not in terms of, uh, there's nothing state, s static in nature. Our physics is a physics of, uh, of things which are limited in time and time changes because it's, it's, uh, they're, they're all possible different moments of time. Um, but uh, when I read the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the the present is real at a moment of time. So I think uh, 
trying to say that there is a presence which is real at any time and not a moment in time. So a, 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 an indexical notion of time makes sense perfectly of our experience of nature and is sufficient uh, without adding something else, uh, which is this passage, uh, which is so hard to even say what it is. Okay, thank you very much. That was very enlightening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next in line, we have uh, Anok Benyami. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks very much, uh, Carlo, for uh, talking. It was uh, as interesting as every Rovelli I've uh, had or uh, read. Um, I'd like to uh, say something about traces and the asymmetry of the traces. If a trace is a, a state of something now, which is a good indication of the, its state or the state of something else in the past, then uh, we have something similar with regard to the future. Um, I look at this thing and say, oh, it's about to fall. So, you know, it's current state is, or uh, I, you know, I take your, uh, your temperature and I tell you, you have the virus. In two days, you start coughing. Or, uh, well, something grimmer. I look around at all of the people here. Everybody is at least uh, over 15. I say, in 100 years, you are all dead. Or I look at the sun and I say, I'll tell you what will happen with it in a million years. So uh, we have traces of the future in this state. I don't see the asymmetry. Perhaps there is some asymmetry, but not, uh, it appears to me, as large as you were. Uh, Took it to be. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I've been uh, I've not been precise uh, in uh, um, in saying what I mean by traces. Uh, so your you, your point is well taken. Let me try to be let me try to answer it and and be a little bit more precise. Um, um, I don't want to give a a, 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 a complete definition of trace. Uh, it, it, however. Um, there is a sense in which we know the future more than the past. Um, sorry, there is a sense in which we know the past more than the future, um, which I think cannot be denied, uh, which is the following. Yes, of course, we can predict the future. Um, and yes, of course, uh, we can derive things about the past uh, from the present. I mean, if I see a storm falling in this particular moment is falling, I'm pretty sure that is going to continue to fall. And I'm pretty sure that it comes from higher, right? It's just, uh, I mean, where is the difference here? Um, I, I used another example. Um, uh, I, I use the solar system dynamics. Uh, we look at the motion of the, of the planets around the sun. We use Newtonian physics. Uh, and uh, we can compute where the planets were in the past. In fact, we are. We know very well where the planets were in the past. Uh, we know where was Venus that particular day of the uh, fourth century before, before the common era. And equally, we know we can do that about the future. Um, notice that in both cases, we could be wrong, right? Because in the future, something might happen. But also in the past, something might have happened, which, uh, which actually maybe, uh, I don't know, a, a comet went through and the, 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 the motion of Venus was, was moved and, the, and we, we do it wrong. So there is an equal uncertainty in, in both directions. So all this is true. Uh, however, beside that, there are additional informations we have of the past uh, which do not have a corresponding um, uh, uh, analog in the future. Because uh, I can, we can compute eclipses in the future, in the past, uh, but we also have uh, a, a, a Babylonian tablet saying there was eclipse that day. We have a writing by Kepler that saw an eclipse a certain day. That we don't have of the future. Uh, we have a picture, I, have a, I know I'm gonna die, okay? <laughs> and I, I, was, I know I was born. Um, and thanks for reminding all of us. Uh, it's good to think about that. Um, but in, in these addition, epidemic days, we know what can you expect. Right. <laughs> uh, but in addition, I have pictures of myself young. I don't have picture of myself old. So there is an asymmetry here. Um, if I look at the moon, uh, there are craters in the moon, uh, which 
testifies about uh, past uh, impact of meteorites. I know very little about future impacts of meteorites. And uh, this, so I'm not being precise here, but I think is without doubt that uh, we can give a much more precise account of the past than in the future using something, okay? If I know, if I want to know the history of, uh, of, uh, of Poland or of Italy, uh, I know a lot about the history of Italy in the past centuries. I know very little about the history of Italy in the future centuries. So there is this, uh, this imbalance. By, by the way, you have a wonderful Renaissance image in the, <laughs> in the back of yours, which reminds me of the past, not of the future. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, uh, this difference is what I call the existence of crisis. And this, what I want to account for, which doesn't mean that everything which I interpret of traces can be interpreted this way, and it doesn't mean that every information I have about the past or the future is of this sort, but there is a special source of information we, we have about the past which we do not have about the future, which I think cannot be doubted. I remember what I did yesterday, I don't remember what I will do tomorrow. So my question as a physicist was, can I give a physicist account of this imbalance? And uh, it, it seemed very hard for me for a long time because why thermodynamics would give anything like that? And then I realized that in fact, uh, uh, quite remarkably, uh, similar things happen as soon as you have a certain thermodynamical situation which I, uh, which I described. So I think that, uh, um, uh, you know, past law entropy, system separation, and long term realization times immediately produce uh, particular situations which testify about the future in some sense and not about the past. Uh, may I, uh, yeah, Antonio, may I uh, add a little? Yes, yes. Thanks very much. Um, uh, so uh, I accept uh, practically, you know, what, uh, well, almost all you've said, but uh, I would like to emphasize that it's a matter of degree and sometimes of a lesser degree than uh, uh, you might think. So uh, you uh, read uh, a calculation that uh, someone did 50 years ago, and it says next year there will be an eclipse. And, you, uh, and so you, in the tablets, in the Babylonian uh, tablets, you find things about the future as well. And you find in the Babylonian tablets Sorry that uh, Gilgamesh killed, uh, I don't remember who. That's wrong, right? So uh, you have to be careful here uh, in this. And also uh, memory. You say you remember the past. Now here's something I remember. Uh, tomorrow I'm, if, I'm meeting a friend at 10 o'clock. So I remember the future. Memory is not necessarily about the past. Memory can be of the, of the future. I remember what I'm going to do next week. Memory is more like retention of uh, knowledge acquired in the past, and it need not be about the past. So even with memory, the difference is not as uh, large as uh, people assume. Yeah, th thanks for pointing this out. This is a, this is a good point. Let, let me turn the question to you. I, I, I take this point. So there is a sense in which you remember the future, and there is a, the, the, the distinction is not so sharp um, as one may point out. But would you, you go? as far as saying that uh, we have an equal amount of information about the past and the future? No. So good. So that's, that's why I, I want to account for this non-equality. And that's why I was vague in, 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 in defining traces. Yes, with this I agree. I just want you to emphasize that it's a, a matter of a degree and uh, often of a lesser degree than we uh, at first might think. Yeah, yeah, I take the point. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Now we have Sinem Salva, if I don't mispronounce it. So please uh, go yeah. ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for this great, great talk. And uh, actually my question is, uh, so the, the topic is quite uh, interesting and there are many things to ask. I was thinking lots of things in the meantime. And, uh, but basically my question is, so if we go back to beginning of universe, 
I think we could say there is no space and no time because our perception is coming, all these perce perceptions are coming from a mass, I think. But if we go back to beginning of universe, if there is no mass, so there will be no space and no time. So in, at this moment, are we referring to everything? Uh, I mean, these all these concepts uh, related to mass, because now we are in mass, our body physically in a mass, but our brain, our head can act faster than light, I think. Even we can say this faster than light, for instance, if there are any other universes. So uh, my question is, we are acting like this, we are thinking like this, we are, we are thinking like time has now, time has past and future because we are in mass. And also, can it be that this universe is, can be a particle itself? Because uh, we know that now is gluons, quarks are uh, interacting itself and producing new particles like proton, blah, blah. But before this, uh, there was no these interactions. And maybe before this, there was no uh, masks and there was no these interac interactions even. So, um, uh, can it be that the universe itself, a particle, and uh, do you think that all these uh, principles are acts coming from because we are uh, in a mass? So, uh, because simply there should be no space and no time before mass. Um, look, um, I think the questions of the form, could it be that, are not well posed questions. Um, I mean, everything could be, but that's not what science is about. Uh, science is about uh, trying to um, uh, make a coherent story on the basis of what we know, uh, trying to understand the phenomena that we don't know yet. Um, the, Wide speculation can go in all directions, but I don't think that wide speculations are, are useful. Uh, at the beginning of the universe, we go out from uh, the regime which control very well. The regime we control very well is when uh, um, uh, space-time gravitational field is classical and generativity works very well, and it seems to work spectacularly well back in time to uh, a very teeny amount of time uh, before the hypothetical Big Bang. Um, if you want to understand what happened there, we just need a theory that uh, uh, extends our understanding of the gravitational field outside the classical regime, because we know that generativity is going to be affected by quantum effects there. So the point is not to speculating what could happen there. The point is to construct a theory uh, which accounts for quantum effects of, of gravity and, and then ask the theory what, what, this, uh, what may happen. And in the current theory, uh, in fact, in the current theory is plural that we have about quantum gravity. Um, the, as I said, the, the, the notion of space-time continues disappear, but not in some mysterious way, in a very simple way, in the same sense in which um, the notion of a continuum electromagnetic field disappears and is replaced by quanta of, uh, um, of the photons. So I expect that uh, if the current theories are confirmed, which they aren't yet, uh, the continuous space-time disappears. So the, the notion of space-time in the sense of this continuous in which things happen uh, is not going to be good for describing what happened there. But there is a quantum theory, uh, comprehensible, usable, usable for making predictions, um, written in terms of quanta of space-time, quanta of gravity, and probability transition amplitudes. The way we write uh, um, quantum theories that should uh, uh, tell us what happened at the Big Bang. And uh, there's a huge literature on that. There is a uh, uh, literature on quantum cosmology, their, their models, uh, their, uh, there, there is a serious work of what the quantum theory of gravity is currently tentatively predicting about uh, 
uh, about quantum, about that passage. Um, quite surprisingly, uh, in fact, it was quite surprisingly for me, most of the world indicates that it's not so dramatic what happens to space-time at the Big Bang, if we have to believe um, the theories. In fact, if we go back in time, the universe become very compressed, uh, but then it doesn't go very, it doesn't go much away from, uh, from a classical description. It just, uh, it just bounces back and, and, and reopens. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark Bicard has asked a question in the public chat, so I'm reading it. So uh, he asks, if local dynamics is superpositional, would it, would it not follow that micro interaction intrinsically lose information and therefore induce an orientation at the micro level? Ah, great question. I'm, I'm finishing writing a paper with two uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Pietro Donà and uh, Andrea Di Biagio on, on that. We've been rewriting the introduction. I spent the morning rewriting the introduction. We're going to post it recently. So the question is, uh, uh, does quantum mechanics in itself uh, breaks time reversal invariance? Is, is there something in the measurement process, in a sense, because the Schrodinger equation is time reversal invariant. But quantum mechanics is not just the Schrodinger equation, it's also measurement in some sense. Um, this would require a, a, an extensive discussion, but I am convinced that the answer is no. So there's nothing in the measurement problem, there's nothing in, the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in quantum theory uh, that is different than classical theory as long as, uh, as, um, uh, as far as time reversal invariance is concerned. But let me be more precise because this it, is a subtle. Uh, we usually think in of quantum theory in terms of me laboratory measurement. In, in a measurement, we make a lab uh, in a laboratory, we make a preparation with a measurement and so on and so forth. Now those measurements are interactions of a quantum system with our macroscopic apparata. Um, which are macroscopic things, and we are macroscopic things, time-oriented, and uh, we wait for um, for the coherence to act, and uh, uh, we only consider a, a measurement ended uh, once the 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 macroscopic apparatus uh, has a, a fixed value because the information about the interference is gone into, into the environment thanks to the coherence. So in a sense, yes, if you think that um, quantum mechanics uh, is uh, the interaction of a quantum system with a classical macroscopic things that decoheres and loses information in the environment, then of course, of course, there is time orientation there. But what is this time orientation? Well, this is exactly the entropy gro gro growth um, of the of the coherence. The coherence loses information, so makes entropy go. By itself, the quantum dynamics is still time reversal invariant. And I think that the reason for which we should uh, not just interpret quantum mechanics as the interaction of quantum system with macroscopic classical system, we should give a formulation of quantum mechanics that allows us not to use macro systems for making sense of it. And I think this is possible. Relational quantum mechanics is one, there are others. Many world interpretation does the same. Uh, Bohmian theory does the same. So quantum mechanics by itself does not break time reversal invariance. Uh, if you have a sequence of measurements, you can go one direction or the other. Um, the probability uh, uh, relations, uh, you can switch back in, in time does the same. The measurement process itself, uh, it's time oriented because we are macroscopic observers that prepare and then measure, okay? Um, but this is not part of the quantum dynamics itself. It's, it, it, it's part of our inter classical interaction with the quantum systems. Okay, thank you. Uh, I received uh, a chat message uh, from uh, Margherita Pascucci, uh, wanted to ask a question. I don't know, Margherita, do you want to ask yes, your question? Yes, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, very yeah, good. Yeah, right. uh, first of all, yeah, 
Thank you so much, Professor Rovelli. And um, I am a philosopher, so my question risks to be very naive, <laughs> but uh, I want to pose it anyhow. Um, while you were talking about traces of the past and agency in the future, um, your description reminded me of uh, the notion of eternity in Spinoza, and especially the subspecie eternitatis. Um, so, um, yeah, my question is, is it, uh, because you, you touched on Spinoza very briefly, but um, uh, do you think that Spinoza can be uh, uh, applied to your scheme and also to these, um, uh, where is the uh, place of Carnot, uh, Sadi Carnot's machine um, from the point of view of the irreversibility of time in, in your scheme? Let us say. Sorry if it is naive, but uh, yeah. Um. Yes, you started by saying uh, I'm a philosopher, so uh, excuse me if the question is naive. I would say you're a philosopher, so uh, I, I should excuse you if your question is deep, because it's <laughs> very deep. But, um, no, no, you you go to the core of story. So let me try to answer. Um, uh, reading the ethics of, uh, of Spinoza, and in particular, uh, the part of the ethics where he um, described, where he talked about uh, uh, freedom and the possibility of, uh, uh, of, of humans to, um, to act, uh, for me, personally, it was crucial in, uh, uh, in my sort of intellectual growth because uh, it's unbelievably clarifying. Um, uh, of course, as, as a scientist, I have to, 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 to translate Spinoza and to, 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 to get rid of a lot of his uh, language assumption, many, many things, but the core of it, it's, uh, it, uh, um, I think it's incredibly clean and simple and um, because he made this distinction, he said the uh, subspecial gravitatis, I mean, uh, uh, in, in Spinoza, what, what is actually going on and, and he, does nothing, he doesn't know anything about quantum theory, right? So um, for him, uh, uh, the world is deterministic, completely deterministic. Everything happens because of a reason and uh, 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 the, the, the happening of, 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 of reality is, is, is uniquely determined. But then the question is how is this compatible with our feeling of being free? And this is, you know, this is a part of this, the core of the of the story because our feeling to to be free is the core of our sense of flowing time and opening of future and and and, and closure of the of the past. As Spinoza says, there is no contradiction. In a sense, the way he put it is that um, I would put it a different language. The way he put it is that uh, um, the sense of freedom is an illusion. And only he's very strong. He says only stupid people can think that they are really free. In reality, what is going on is that uh, um, there, there is, a, a, in his language, we have an image of ourselves, and the image of ourselves is incomplete. And so it's because of this incompleteness um, that we uh, don't understand why we do things. Um, this is brilliant. And I think many uh, neural scientists to get today, I, I could name. Uh, several were directly influenced by, by, by Spinoza and think in these terms. Uh, that is, uh, we, th there is a macro microscopic description, Spinoza would say, subspecies eternitatis, um, of what actually is going on, which in the future is determined by the past. But in order to have to know the, past, the future from the past, we should know the, the full story, the full microphysics. Uh, the microphysics classically determines the past. Quantum mechanics doesn't even, but that has nothing to do with the story. Um, the sense of freedom comes because we do not know the microphysics. We have a widely um, uh, microscopic, imprecise, approximate, foggy picture of the of the of the world that does allow us uh, to make uh, uh, rational reconstructions of causal. Uh, links, but these causal links break at some point because the microphysics comes out and affect the macrophysics. This is exactly the the, the branching, and this is um, uh, this is the 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 this is the free will. This is this is freedom, which is real. 
is a breaking of the microscopic causal links due to a, a phenomenon that we don't, we, don't, we don't control. Now, the last part of the question was about the uh, Sadi uh, Carnot uh, machine. Um, that's the beginning of uh, thermodynamics, of course, is a source of, uh, of, um, uh, of thermodynamics. Uh, Carnot was the first one who sort of uh, uh, started to realize that there is something irreversible in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in heat. And uh, he had no idea of what came later with uh, um, mostly Boltzmann and Maxwell, uh, which is understanding that the phenomenon he had put his finger upon and uh, that um, um, it was later uh, better formalized by, uh, by, by others, uh, introducing the notion of entropy and so on and so forth, uh, is a phenomenon connected to microphysics and, and, and macrophysics. Sadi so Carnot had this, uh, uh, had a very um, sort of mechanical idea that heat goes from uh, um, uh, hot things to cold things, uh, uh, like water falls down, uh, uh, and, and, and doesn't go up, but that's how it, it, it produces energy. But his key point was that it doesn't, it doesn't go up. Enough. So he re recognized that in heat, there is a fundamental irreversibility. And later it was understood that heat had to do with many degrees of freedom, which we don't account. So it's just the beginning of the story. The, the story, in a sense, what I'm, what I'm doing is a continuation, the, this initial intuition by, uh, uh, by Carnot that was clarified uh, uh, with the introduction of entropy and then by Maxwell and Boltzmann. And, uh, and, uh, and I think it, it's the same intuition that allows us to understand fully where is the full irreversibility come from, not just in thermodynamics, but also in traces in, uh, in agency. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Oka uh, Okar raised his hand literally, so please go ahead. You have to unmute your microphone, otherwise we cannot hear you. Sorry. Okay, thank, I say thank you very much for the interesting and motivating talk, Carlo. And coming back to entropy, the notion of entropy, I would like to ask the following. Since uh, uh, we are in a way in the theory of physics in general, they are trying to get up, they are, they are trying to get rid of time and space in, in some sense. Uh, and write laws without those notions. And according to your talk, uh, time and space and some sort of illusion that can be, uh, that, that you justify using the entropy uh, notion. Uh, my question is, why should I take seriously uh, the notion of entropy to, to say that uh, we come from a more ordered uh, state of the world. S s again, if I am trying to get rid of time and space in some sense, and the way I've justified that time, for example, is a sort of illusion, I use the notion of entropy, why I should take seriously the notion of entropy and don't, and don't try to get rid of that also, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, that's not what I'm doing. I, I'm not trying to get rid of time and space, and I'm not trying to uh, have the notion of entropy as fundamental, and from that derive uh, time, which would justify your question. Why, so why should I take the notion of entropy as serious? That's not at all what I'm trying to do. I'm taking the physics that we know, okay? And just taking the physics as we know it. And then taking also suggestions uh, from quantum gravity, uh, seriously. I mean, there should be some, some further indication that we make some, some additional step. In the physics that we know, even without quantum gravity, there are some 
aspect of temporality that we do understand that they are not universal or fundamental, they belong to approximations. So it's not that time is illusory, time is real, but it's real within an approximation. I mean, I, um, is a sunset illusory? Well, no, I mean, there's a sunset. I mean, it's not, we're not mistaken in, in a sunset. But if we interpret the sunset as the, the, the sun uh, diving in the, in the ocean or going down, no, we're just making a mistake. The sunset is uh, us moving and the sun is just doing nothing uh, there. And uh, so it, the sunset is a, it's something we understand better by going to a better description of the world than just the sun moving around and, or, or, or diving in the ocean and, and, and waking up the, the morning on the other side. So similarly, the uh, common notion of time, uh, it's, it's wrong if we take it as the fundamental notion of time because we have just learned that generativity works very well because we have learned that quantum mechanics, so it cannot be right, okay? But we do understand how it emerges uh, in, within some approximation. In the same spirit, we do understand that the orientation of time is not in the fundamental uh, laws, but it comes from the fact of using macroscopic variables, which is a fact. It's not that we invent entropy. Entropy is not invention. It's just a realization that once, if, if we describe a system in terms of macroscopic variables, then you can assign a number to any macroscopic state, which is the number of microstates, okay? And then one gets easily convinced that it's very reasonable that if at some time this number is smaller than what it could, uh, by generosity, it, 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 uh, it goes up. So entropy is there. The inappropriateness of our intuition about time for describing the world on larger um, domains is there. It's just in the physics uh, we know. I'm just trying to put the, 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 the pieces together to better understand why we have uh, the sense of a fixed past and open future and the passing of time as uh, somebody asked before. Uh, thank you. I think we can take the very last thank you. question. Uh, Koichi Ito, please go ahead. Um, I hope I, you can hear me and um, I'm, I'm actually an undergraduate student so maybe I misunderstood your lecture although actually I really enjoyed your um, talk and um, yes I'd like to ask you a question. Um, my question is that uh, um, well uh, I think that uh, the, the time flow or the time irre 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 irreversibility um, stems in the fact of the macroscopic uh, world that you mentioned and um, well, actually, I, I am aware of the hypothesis called um, eigenstate uh, thermal thermalization hypothesis, which is actually, uh, um, I think, uh, somewhat uh, derives the, the second law of the thermodynamics from the quantum mechanics. So my question is that, um, I mean, yeah, so maybe I thought that uh, uh, the mac microscopic world actually can um, be more fundamental, even in the sense of um, en entropy stuff. And also, um, if you actually postulate the uh, unitary dynamics and also maybe uh, consider the coherence what you mentioned earlier, um, wouldn't it be uh, perfect to actually account for the um, um, nature of the time irreversibility? And maybe I thought that it was all that we need to actually talk about uh, time. So my other question is that, uh, would you clarify for me that, um, what is actually known in the physical world or, the, or the, in the field of, field of physics and what is unknown and what is the future you know, investigation um, assignment or something that we can have to investigate for. Thank you. Yes, it's a good question. I'm, I'm glad you asked it. Um, I know of these work, this works. Um, I think that uh, um, they're technically good, but often, uh, conceptually misleading. Um, it's certainly true that um, uh, the coherence 
uh, creates a um, breaks the direction of time. So it creates an arrow of time. Uh, and, uh, and, and one can study in detail how this happens. Uh, one is tempted from that. No, no, so this is okay, but one, what, why is misleading? Because one isn't tempted from that to say, oh, so therefore in quantum mechanics there's an arrow of time. And this is, I think, is completely wrong. Uh, because in the actual uh, thermalization due to the coherence, what is happening is that we are assuming that there is a special initial state and we are computing that unitarily it goes, it, it evolves into a non-special um, state. So sort of entropy go, goes up. This is exactly a past low entropy hypothesis uh, giving rise to a uh, gradient of entropy in the direction of time. So it's not uh, denying the usual story, it's just repeating the usual story. And you don't need quantum mechanics for this story. It's already true in classical theory. It's always true that if you start from something special and you uh, assume genericity, the special thing evolves into a generic thing, okay? That's the, um, uh, that's the, our understanding of the arrow of time which we see around us. So we understand the arrow of time which we see around us in terms of genericity plus something special about the state of the thing with respect to some description um, in some direction of time which we call past. And the, the puzzling thing which Chris uh, Butry, uh, pointed out at the beginning is first question is, uh, wait a minute, there's a genericity assumption and a specialist assumption. So there is something to understand more. That's an open question. The, the uh, playing out the story within quantum mechanics doesn't clarify what is going on. It just shows that even in quantum mechanics, what happens is the same thing that in classical mechanics, namely, if you have in some sense, in some large sense, um, initial low entropy, then the entropy goes up and therefore uh, there is an arrow of time. But it's not quantum mechanics because the same thing's happening in classical mechanics already. We haven't understood anything. We just have shown that the quantum story is the same as the classical story. We have the same clarity and the same puzzles. Right, so does that mean that if we actually find out uh, the, uh, I mean, account for the low entropy in the past, does that actually clarify the, you know, the nature of the time irreversibility more, no matter what is classical or, or, or quantum? Exactly, exactly. I think so, that uh, the, the question about the direction of time from a physicist, and I think in general, it's entirely reduced to the question of why low entropy in the past. Right, right, I see. Thank you very much. I understand. Low entropy in a general sense, uh, specialness in the past. Right, I see. Thank you very much. Thank you.